Hello and welcome. And today we have got a seriously cool interview with a friend of mine who lives over in Alaska, but has spent over an entire year in Antarctica near the South Pole. How cool is that? The things that he's seen, the things that he's been connecting the dots. We've done a tiny bit of research ourselves, asking questions about all sorts of weird and wonderful things about Antarctica. What is really going on out there? So without further ado, we're going to bring in our guest. His name is Eric, and he has his own awesome website called Deciphering.tv. And here is Eric. How are you doing, sir? I am doing fantastic today, Funky Prepper. Awesome. Happy days. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. And um, we was just having a little chat offline like we done last time. And um, boy, have we got an interesting show, some dots to connect, some deep diving, and some alternative viewpoints about what the mainstream is putting out there because it's not what it is so if we can go right back to the beginning um by trade you're a plumber and a bloody good one at that and because of that you ended up in antarctica so tell us a little bit about your background in long island and your clients and all of that sort of stuff uh, where this story starts as a tradesman yeah i guess it, it starts on um <clears throat> on what is uh, commonly referred to as the, the North Shore of Long Island or the Gold Coast. There is a, an amount of wealth that is hidden over in that little corner of the world that is unbeknownst to most. In regards to my clientele and the type of folks that I worked for would be the, um, how do I put it, uh, you know, way, way back in the day, tradesmen, uh, like myself and Mr. Prepper here, remember things like magazine racks in the fancier <laughs> bathrooms, right? You know, the rich yeah. people. That's how the other half lived. They had magazines next to their toilet. That's the big secret. <laughs> in custom wall racks. But those anyhow, <laughs> yeah, those days. So, um, but my clients back in the day were very interesting because in the magazine rack of the master bathroom would be things like um, the Trilateral Commission Quarterly, Whoa. or the Council on Foreign Relations Annual. In the bathroom? This was, <laughs> this, these were the clients that I had. So, you know, people say, well, what can you learn from being a plumber? You know what? You can learn a lot being yeah. a plumber, yeah. especially when you start paying attention to details like that going on around you. You yeah. might it's say, well, like you're the gray man. You're the gray man. It's just there and observing, you know? Fair play. Oh, absolutely. That's um, I. I absolutely um, took advantage that that was observable of how people treated me regularly. In that environment, that that level of wealth, I was invisible to most people. I would work in some of the most um, posh country clubs on Long Island. Hmm. For, I mean, really freakishly wealthy people. And there could be a leak in the ladies' bathroom in the, the locker room area, which is opulence beyond description for some of these country clubs. Um, hmm. But for all practical purposes, I was invisible. I would, uh, you know, it's just part of, part of the job. You go in the locker room, there's ladies changing all over the place. I'm nothing to them. Yeah. For them to be disrobing and the such um, in the proximity of, I was a peon. There was all there was other male staffing there as well that was equally invisible. I was just in the same category. Wow. So do you think they might have been um, lapsadaisical, for want of a better term, with the the clients? Sorry, not the clients, but the um, the tradesmen like yourself. Every now and again, they might need an electrician, a plaster, or whatever it is. They're literally going to be working there in the background. You know, uh, would they continue to have discussions or would they be quiet when you went to the room? Or how did that roll when you was there? I think there was portions of both, mm. um, for sure, because, you know, it was a full spectrum experience. But I do believe that for the most part, <clears throat> I guess I would say I would... I was working in what would be considered very intimate, intimate environments to these people. You know, it's their, it's their homes, their bedrooms, their master bathrooms. It is an area where they inherently, uh, 
felt safe. Feel relaxed, and yeah. And can speak their mind. And I would say that for the most part, they just did. Wow. So, That's yeah, and, and when you consider the, the level of folks that they well. were, you know, just, yeah. just breadcrumbs from that table, so to say, adds up to a meal. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting from um, an observer's point of view, you know, to be in the company of such um, rich, powerful and influential people. I mean, like you say, if you used to stay in the background like a ghost and you got on with your work, you know, would they <clears throat> engage in conversations with you or was you just seen as, oh, it's just the plumber, just leave him alone or did they chat to you at all? They did actually chat with me and this is testimony that I've given out previously <clears throat> is um, some of the really peculiar circumstances I found myself in. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to, it's kind of like a, uh, a, a quilt of recollections because it, I can't put it all to one, but I mean, all of these pieces occurred, so to say, uh, yeah. I'm like, instead of paraphrasing, I'm like para visualizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, but like as an example, it would be like, you know, I'm thinking of this time where I was, I was at a, just a, a wet bar inside a massive living room, some billionaires living room. And being asked to join the conversation um, was always felt very peculiar to me because of the pre-existing condition of seemingly being invisible. Yeah. So all of a sudden, even being engaged was like, oh, they're paying attention to me. I'm not wholly invisible right now, right? Now that I want to talk about something. So that would be my my initial state of surprise in that circumstance. But yeah, there was a fistful of times that I would get asked to sit down within a, you know, small circle of billionaires where they would want to engage me and get my opinion on what it was they were just talking about. So, you know, they were, they would have been discussing something and I'm just there fixing the faucet or whatever. And all of a sudden they say, Hey, you know, Eric, what do you, what do you think about this? And I get brought into the conversation and yeah, it was extremely peculiar uh, yeah. to be getting observed by them and then engaged by them and then having my opinion being, you know, given weight. Yeah. So, I mean, all of these things were, were, were quite odd. Uh, and unless I remind folks that, you know, um, I was in my early twenties at the time. Wow. Impressionable you know, age. So it's not like yeah, it's not like I was you know some known rocket science that they needed to engage with, but it was um, it was very interesting to me that the engagement occurred regardless of how peculiar I thought it was, yeah. and it happened enough that it it seemed very interesting to me. Can you can you imagine um, being that twenty year old right now with what you know based on the reading yeah. material in the bathroom too? <laughs> Oh my God, that's that is so <laughs> funny that you just made me think that. Could I, could I imagine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. The probing questions, incredible. Wow. Mm -hmm. But yes, that's that's in an area called Long Island, um, just outside of New York, and it's quite an interesting place because we have um, some history there as well, haven't we? Um, a long, long time ago, some of you guys will probably know um, Nikola Tesla. And here it is, the map of the world. Boom. And Eric's right up here in AK. I'm right down there in the UK. But we're going right in up to here. And this pretty much gives people, there's Long Island. It's a island and it's long. Why wouldn't they call it Long <laughs> Island? So right up here. They call it the Science Center now. I believe it was called something else a long, long time ago. Now, I this believe it just caught on the fire world. the other day. Say what? I believe it just burned to the ground the other day. No way. Are you I think serious? I, just saw a head I think so. I did not look into corroboration on this, but I believe that I came across an article that I peeked at recently that there was some sort of a massive fire at that facility. Wow. I had and, no idea. And I've wow. been here. This is the old Warden Cliff facility. Um, it is very peculiar over there. Uh, there you go. You, you're looking at it right there at the bottom right hand of your screen is the, the base of where the tower was. Yeah, exactly. 
that's why I wanted to zoom out to show it because they've even named a street after him. I mean, after all yeah. what is achieved, and he ends up with a street. I mean, that guy should be world famous, in my opinion, for what he's achieved. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a travesty what happened with his information, his reputation, everything to do with what's going on with Tesla, um, is connected uh -huh. to what's wrong within the world right now. <clears throat> so yeah, when you look at Long Island, and it is just. It looks to me like um, a wealthy playground. We've got somewhere very similar in the UK called Sandbanks, and it's right down south. It pretty much looks like somewhere um, in the Bahamas. It's beautiful with um, sand and palm trees and stuff. But the, the amount of wealth who currently live on this island, you couldn't even put um, a guesstimate on it, could you really? No, not in the slightest, because yeah. it's, it's almost incalculable, because that's where the, the real wealthy elite are hiding out, and you don't know their names. Yeah. Everybody thinks that they know who the rich people are on this planet. And I assure you, the really rich people spend good money to make sure you're never going to know their name. There's too many, too many rich people had their heads chopped off uh, <laughs> back in the day. And they learned their lesson to no longer be known in public. Um, they, they got humble enough um, to stop bragging publicly and, you know, it's no longer the, the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers and the Morgans and the Piedmonts, you know, being public and trying to outdo each other because that got people in trouble. Yeah. So now they sure. do things behind closed doors. You know, nobody knows who the Rothschilds are specifically all over the planet like they used to. It's just yeah. the, the game is still going on. It's just that um, the really good players pay good money to make sure you're paying attention to other Pawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're so wealthy and so powerful, the last thing you want is everyone knowing who you are. Correct. So we're never going to really know. Everyone right. that we see publicly, they're just doing as they're told, really. And um, right, it makes me everybody laugh. thinks being a celebrity and rich is this like almost like the penultimate place to be in life, but it's really one of the worst positions that you can be in life. And yeah. they're like the they're like the biggest whores on the planet. The celebrities are the ones that are so public. They're the that human takes, shield, it, they really. <laughs> yeah, they they, they 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 realize when they have their piles of money and stuff that they blew it. That the publicity is actually terrible, and yeah. privacy is a wonderful thing. And the the really wealthy people are not celebrities. Celebrities are pawns of the wealthy, and. Mm. Again, the, the, the really elite folks on this planet, we do not know their names. No. And we probably never will. But like I say, um, it does make me laugh when every year they publish the, the Forbes Top 100 Rich List. I mean, every single person on that list, that is literally pocket money to these guys, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I just yeah, laugh that, when that, it comes out. That list is the, it's the lineup of the pawns of your enemy. Pretty much, yeah. They're in the yeah, front. The highest, paid, the highest paid pawns they got, but every one of those people is a scapegoat for some yeah. other industry or faction. Yeah. They're like, um, they're cannon fodder in pinstripe suits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. They're well-paid generals, um, but they're not the commander-in-chief. Yeah, yeah. I remember an old um, song years ago by Rusty Rivets. I don't know if you've heard of those. They said the mm -hmm. architects are gone, only the managers are left. <laughs> mm -hmm. Makes you think about a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So after having a little gloss over about um, plumbing and, and where you used to hang out and where you lived, and obviously Nikola Tesla there and, you know, Project Paperclip for what was happening after World War II, there's a lot going on around Long Island. So jumping from there all the way to Antarctica, how was it? Um, I mean, from what I remember the last time we spoke, these were hard times, weren't they, back then, with the recession and everything else? So trying to yeah. find work was a complete nightmare. So mm -hmm. I understood you had the same you had the same problem. But most of us did, just couldn't find a job. But this yeah, one... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was, the only, that was the only thing that got me to go down to Antarctica, South Pole Station for winter. I had no... I was not <clears throat> desiring some wild adventure. I had no idea what I was in for. This was not something I had been seeking out for years, like a lot of the other people in the program. It just yeah. wasn't the case. 
I had a business on Long Island that was floundering because of the terrible economical circumstances that came around. And I was just doing my best to keep my head above water, to keep food on the table. And literally, the Raytheon Polar Services contract was the only people looking to cut me a check at that time. Wow. So it's, I mean, I mean, anybody else out there got kids? I, I took the check. I mean, is that yeah. simple? I took the job. Go um, is, is what it is that everybody, Oh, you know, you can't plumb down there. They're lying. To, I said, listen, I have no, I have no idea. If, if you want to enter this conversation by cutting me a check, I'll come listen to what you have to say. But at that time it was, you know, <laughs> But you've got to do something, in you? I mean, and, it, mm -hmm. and it's weird because I've been offered um, contracts all over the Middle East and stuff. And the money wasn't that great, but it was something to do at the time mm -hmm. because there wasn't that many jobs. But I, I mainly went basically just to get money, obviously, but the experience as well, the experience of working in another country, um, mm -hmm. immersing myself with different cultures. I worked in Iran, and it's an incredible part of the world. And mm -hmm. worked in Germany and all over Europe and all over the UK. So you get this amazing opportunity to work in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it on the map, it's just huge. It's not like some tiny little island in the South Pole. It is massive, isn't it? Yeah, it is really piss poorly located. <laughs> <laughs> the only way you can go is north, apparently, it's so far out. I mean, let's be realistic. I mean, I was, I was, I mean, there's... I didn't have a huge pros list in this equation. I mostly saw this as, as you know, a, a, a bad deal that I was just going to have to suffer through. Mm. It was not, you know, the skies were beautiful during the winter season and it was absolutely, you know, it, it wound up being the experience of a lifetime. So to say, um, yeah but it was not something that I saw coming that way. Yeah. And, and it was certainly thing, it. <laughs> Yeah. I was just going to say, the weird thing about Antarctica is there's so much which is not being said. And it is a very highly secretive, very shady sort of place with dodgy people there, all sorts of projects going on. And everyone wants to know. But not everyone has come across someone who is willing to talk about their experience there. So based upon the sensitivity of what we're going to be talking about. There's no way we can just randomly waffle over all of this on YouTube for all sorts of reasons. We're talking defense contracts. We're talking shady people, spooks, all of the rest of it. Now, we can't really do it on YouTube, but it is going to be able to be watched in its entirety. If you click on the link below the video, it will take you straight there and you can watch the rest. So we're going to join everyone over on the website. So Say bye, YouTube, and uh, say bye-bye, Eric. You go for it, too. All right. We'll see you over on the website. Thanks for watching, guys. Stay funky.